Tada, tada. Okay. Oh, it's cool. It's recording. Okay. So I have to do. I have to say small things now. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> Fuck. You don't have to. It's okay. How did I get suckered into this? Uh, I'm really good at doing that. <laughs> Okay. Um, Did you do any post editing? Not really. I don't really do it's much fine. post editing. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's start with your name. <laughs> with my name? Yeah. Um, I, I only know you as HF. HF, which it's actually correct for the most part. Yeah. Um, it's actually the abbreviation of Herr Flupke, which is one of the many monikers I go by on the internet and in real life. Oh, okay. Well, does it mean anything? Um, yeah. Technically, yes. Um, Herr is just the German for Mr. and Flopke is just a super boring thing, surname, sort of. Mm. And the, the, the basic idea behind that... Oh yeah, should I look to you or should I look at the camera? Uh, either way. Okay, I'll look at both ways. Oh god, damn. <laughs> um, Usually I try to sit here behind the camera, but... Okay. Um, so the, the origin story of that name is basically at one point, actually when I started out in the hacker scene, a lot of people were on chat, like on IRC and Jabber or XMPP or the technology behind Google Talk and Facebook chat for you who don't know what XMPP is. Um, and as often, also for a shell account, you need a name and I'm like, oh fuck, I need a name. And then I'm like, okay, and it was like back in the 90s. Um, so I, th I, I thought really hard for like 10 seconds <laughs> and I chose Herr Flupke mm. because it's like, it's super boring. And boring means stable and at least in that case, stable means good. Mm -hmm. Because like if I would have called myself Super Hacker 2000, it would have been way awkward 16 years ago. We live in the year 2016, for the record. Mm. Would have been strange just 10 years ago. more awkward as the year Yeah, yeah. Uh, or no, no it's, it would be retro, actually, sort of. Like in this hipster, ironic sense. Mm. Whatever, yeah. Um, that's actually our own story to that name. Um, but as I said, it's like I have many names, many different contexts, okay. which is, yeah. Mm. Yeah, boring names are good. I tried to get a boring name on all my social media accounts and other stuff, but other people got there first. <laughs> <laughs> so it took me more than 10 seconds on each. Okay, um, so that's your name. And, uh, whoa. What's your line of work now? What's my line of work now? Um, for money or for burnout? Let's say for money first. Uh, for money first. I, currently, I am... Um, I'm, I'm a security engineer, actually sort of head of research at a network security startup here in Leipzig. Mm -hmm. And I won't disclose the name because we're burning venture capital. Okay. Uh, and it's, um, it's it's a common policy for me not to disclose my current employees, uh, employers mm. uh, because it, it protects me from a lot of things. Mm. And for all, all you conspiracy theorists out there, no, it's not the government. Wow, well, you're the first guy who works in security who doesn't mind being on camera. Um, Everyone else I've met who is doing security goes like, no, mm. no camera. No, yes. no audio either. Yes, yes I, I, I can relate to that. Um, and there, there are situations where I prefer not to be recorded. Um, but since you interview me as Sarah Flupka, and I mean, at least my social circle knows it and my wider circle knows it. So that's why I'm also sufficiently unspecific about my actual employer and what we're actually working on. Mm. Okay. So, right. And are you doing any projects on your own? Oh yeah. Yes. Uh, the for burnout question. Um, I do a bunch of projects actually. Um, a friend of mine once described what I do. I explain machines to humans and humans to machines. 
mm-hmm. because I, I usually work at the at, at the fringe on of different fields and often where like technology and society collides right. um, and where where there's at least friction um, so what I'm working on is oh, there's a ton of open source projects I contribute code to which is one way to do some something good then currently I'm involved with the smart city thing here in Leipzig mm. I was involved in the disaster response field there most notably with a organization called Geeks Without Bounds which is like Doctors Without Borders but for nerds um, did some rogue organizing there too in, in that area um, have been involved with the CCC mm-hmm. here in Germany um, yeah basically try to do something good with technology that's the, the I know that's super vague um, and that's like one line of work and the other line of work I actually do is doing work with artists mm-hmm. um, which was actually inspired with me staying in China for a while. Um, yeah. What are you doing with artists? That's interesting. Uh, the, the, the art thing. Um, to some extent, I'm a gun for hire for artists. Um, the, the basic motivation was I was in China in the Biennale in Shanghai a few years back and there was a video work being presented and you could see the top bar of the video player and I'm like god damn it full screen it's not rocket science and that sort of tipped me over and I started to see these flaws everywhere and it's not that they're like oh it's interesting or it's revealing something which I would expect in art no it was more like this is just (sighs) people not being adults in some way it's like There, there's a certain, or there should be a certain craft in art, and that was lacking, at least from the technology side. And so I worked with, and I still work with a lot of artists, taking basically taking care of technology, so that when they do their work, they can focus on actually creating artworks. And I'm more the, the person in the background, making sure the technology is right, that stuff is reproducible. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. One... One very recent example was at the HGB, which is the local university for arts, art university. Um, they had what's called Diplom Ausstellung, mm-hmm. which is like a presentation of the um, of the work they've done over the semester, at the end of the semester. It's the one that's going on around the city now, right? Yes, that one actually. Um, and I was involved with helping a few people there getting their work done. One was, for example, a piece involving a website um, where people enter just plain words, and then there's Max a Max patch behind it. For those who don't know what Max is, Max is a basically flow-based programming environment, which has a huge or a large focus on, on audio, but also can do some weird stuff, especially when you couple it with Max MSP and then native jitter, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, basically just a, technically just a simple website, the text import form, plus the Max patch, and what I did, I helped them build the whole thing locally because they were first running it on Google App Engine, which mm-hmm. has its limitations. I'm not talking about privacy concerns depending what people would enter in there so now it's running locally you just only have a local network it's you don't rely on external internet connection anymore it's way more performance stuff like that Hmm. so i basically helped them build the website i did build the network stuff and the networking infrastructure because it turns out there are some undocumented quirks in max when it comes to networking so yeah Okay. That is like the most recent one. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Do you want to know more about that stuff? Mm. 
Yes, but I think we should okay. have one to other things as well. Uh, so, uh, hang on. There, there are some questions I really want to ask, but maybe I should go through this a little yep. bit more uh, in a controlled manner. How, how did you come to join SAP Lab? How did I come to join Sublab? Yeah. I don't know. Like, um, I actually don't know. Um, way, way back then, I, I didn't grow up in Leipzig and I didn't study in Leipzig. I'm actually in Leipzig since uh, maybe two and a half years now, or so not that long. Before that, I was in Dresden. Um, and the contact with Sublab actually happened when I was organizing a symposium on privacy and society and technology called Datenspuren, like data traces. Um, and then we had people like coming all over the place from all the hackerspaces and Sublab was one of them. Uh, and with that, I get to know a few of the people and then I, then you meet people again in different corners of the internet and that's how it developed. And then. I left Dresden, moved to Leipzig, and then Leipzig was, uh, Leipzig. Um, the sub lab was the place to go to to hang out for what I call, what I could loosely describe as my people, as in <sighs> hackers in a really broad sense, but people generally involved with technology apart from a pure engineering mindset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how I ended up in, in a sub lab. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in your two and a half years in sub lab, do, mm -hmm. you, do you think it's changed much? Has it changed much? It's currently changing. Um, it hasn't changed too much in two and a half years, as far as I recall. But also, I'm I'm not here that often. Mm -hmm. I used to be here way way more often than I do now, which has different reasons. Um, but at least now I feel it's changing. How how is it changing? How how is it changing? Um, there seems to be a generational shift going on. Um, I see myself sort of in between with a bias to the old generation. We have new people coming in, taking space over, doing stuff, which is a good thing, and all the people dropping out due to life happening, actually, to some extent. Mm. Which I think is good because nothing is worse than being the cranky old guy in the place and it just, it just suffocates people good well, what do you think of the uh, ongoing discussion about the Pokemon Stuntish oh the dear the Pokemon Go if, if you'll see this in the future just look it up um I don't get it. it. It's cool that people want to meet and want to hang out here. I, I don't see any harm as such. I just don't get Pokemon Go. That's that's it. So as, as much as I'm annoyed by the discussion happening and polluting my mail inbox, I'm totally cool with it happening because I can further. So it's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, I don't, I don't quite get Pokemon either, but I think it's, um, I think for me, it, it's it's better than people going out there and catching all kinds of insects and animals and bringing them home. To, to some extent, yes, but, but... That would be a disaster for the ecology. But then people wouldn't do it because they would probably grossed out by insects. Like don't underestimate people and how easily easy they easily they freak out. Um, because not everything is a fluffy bunny that's out there. Um, yeah, I just don't want to go forward into Pokemon Go because it's it's probably not worth it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested also in um, your experience, kind of 
in many different places. So you've mm -hmm. been, you came from Dresden. Yes. And you've um, been in Singapore. Yes, I've been in Singapore. In China. In China. Where in China? Uh, China, mostly Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. Right. And you've been to all these places for work. Uh, no, actually more for burnout. That's a better way to put it. Right, right. I didn't do stuff for, or I didn't do work work. That's mm -hmm. the best way to put it. Okay. And how, how long did you spend in these places? Oh, how much time did I spend there? Oh, dear. China was in 2014. Two months or so, I think, or no, I think even more. Um, at that time, I was um, basically teaching a course on, on hacking at Tsinghua University, mm -hmm. um, which, which which wasn't called hacking there because hacking is a charge term. And so what, what they have there is called the extreme learning process or XLP. Extreme learning process? Yeah. Okay. It's it's basically a rebranding of the term hacking because you can't say hacking because of reasons. Mm -hmm. So they call it um, extreme learning process and at least back then they did invite people to come over to teach lateral thinking, like thinking out of the box, because what I observed in China is that people are pretty good at solving problems when it's within a narrow corridor but like thinking what's called thinking outside the box or laterally isn't that common apparently hmm. one one thing i attributed to is the, the the stigma in the society with failing which seems to be higher than in the western world um, so people tend to be more cautious, um, which is, but it's a unbelievably broad statement. It's just also more tendency. I don't say that, or I'm not saying that all Chinese are that way, which is how it often came across when I said it in the past, but no, that's not. Um, so yeah, it was like to get them yeah, thinking creatively, unconventionally. How did you do that? Um, how did we do that? It wasn't only me, it was also with other people. Mm -hmm. um, how did we do that? Um, to a large extent, we just hang out with them, <laughs> hoping to get it across by diffusion and osmosis. Um, and then challenging them actually, I'm like preparing small challenges, um, being ambiguous in what the goal is, and then or setting a challenge and not giving them sufficient material for the obvious solution, so they had to improvise. That's that was our way to do it. What, what was the reception like? I'm interested in this partly because Singapore is, I. I Maybe it's better now, but um, it's been roughly the same with failure. There's oh, yeah. a lot of... It's, yes, yeah. definitely. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's getting slightly better in Singapore, as mm -hmm. what I observed over the last few years. Um, but it's similar, yes, in that respect. Um, the reception... Before or after? During. Um, before the response or the reception was incredibly low and stale, like not many people showed up. Hmm. Um, we, we spoke to some folks and they said, yeah, mostly because you didn't say what you were doing and what it's good for. So we were sort of like, yeah, come hang out with us and do awesome things. And they're like, what, what, what does it even mean? Do I get credit for it? Do I get to be like, well, yeah, maybe you get credit, maybe you don't. Um, so it was really, really open and really, really broad, which um, I think wasn't the best choice mm -hmm. in terms of catering to a audience within that culture. But hey, 
um, during the whole thing, people were they felt unsure mm -hmm. to a significant degree, but as soon as they learned that they can make mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes and we don't we don't punish them in any way but actually we go in there and talk them through and um, do things which are humiliating at first as and we, we ask them like what was your mistake and what do you think you did wrong and so on and so on and but then also shifting the, the thinking away from this was a mistake towards a more systemic thinking mm -hmm. um, which is in one way yes you can say it is a mistake but also it was the best best choice you can make with all the knowledge you had at that point because of course now you're smarter now you know more now you would make different choices but back then that was the best choice you could do and also it turns out to be bad in hindsight it was good at that point and that it was actually what matters mm -hmm. there was one one lesson many people took away from it and then also sometimes it's it's not about you as a person because sometimes there is what the left calls the system is just stacked against you um there are things you just can't do or the your surrounding or your environment wouldn't allow you to do um so it's not always your fault so in in that sense or in that weird sense, teaching people to let go of their ego a bit. Yeah, that's the best way to put it. And people were incredibly gracious, and I'm still in contact with a lot of people from back then. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So what what was the reception after then? Uh, the reception after, um, I think it's still continuing at Simhua, um, but I have to look it up. But I have, at least half a year I was looking up the website and it was still there and it looked active, um, judging from my few blurbs of Chinese I can interpret. Um, and it seems to be going on, like it seems to continue. Mm -hmm. um, Do they still call it extreme learning process? I think they still call it the extreme learning process. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think if they teamed up with Makerspace Beijing, mm -hmm. I don't think they have, um, but it's okay. Mm. Which and, and that's also to if they haven't done it, I'm also grateful to some extent because also the hacker maker scene in China is way way different than what I think. I think it should be, which is also like very European or Eurocentric view, but yeah. What is the difference between the hacking scene there and the one over here in Germany? Um, it's way easier if you compare it to the hacker scene to the United States um, because that's actually something I see as sort of like a triangle going on um, because a lot of the, the American hacker scenes got, or at least the public part of the hacker scene got a real boost back in 2000 then around 2007 um, I, I lived in the US in 2008 um, actually it was around when when noise bridge got started I was actually at the thing where they inhabited the first space um, how to explain this um, the the European hacker scene is old, as in it is old. It is old as a public scene. It's way more than thirty years now that there is a that hackers come out of the woodwork and do stuff in public and for for a general audience to see. Um, and also, there, at least in Europe, there is way more a spirit of being a. It's much more a spirit of the, of the enlightenment, in terms of that people see or look at themselves as having a responsibility, also for society around them. 
And so they tend to act in a more civic, not civil, but civic manner, as in it's way more politicized. And in America, it's It's more individualized, plus there's more focus on, or the idea is more on doing things that are great. While great is an ambiguous term, tends to bleed into things that look good or give a good impression, um, which is just more it's more about this is a tendency um, and then also it gets it gets occupied by Silicon Valley a lot and that where China comes into place or Asia in general then when it swings around the globe to China there you have or at least my feeling was you have this weird you have this feeling when when for example when you know a book and people talk about the book but they have just read the cover text but not the actual book and it sort of feels the same in China. It's like a lot of people like they, they found they find this culture which is interesting to them. Um, but it also gives them a lot of hope and especially the, the, the American interpretation of what it means to be a hacker, um, especially or not only American but also popular interpretation caters toward this whole idea of also entrepreneurship and being self-made. And I see that a lot of people in China, like they believe in it, which which I think is, is is horrifying to an extent. Because if you look at the U.S., the people who are promoting it, those are white dudes who like have stable income and they do it in their free time. They basically have the resources to do it in their free time and to fail. While in China, a lot of people see, hey, these are things I can use, um, but I also want to get out of poverty. I want to make an income. And that is where I think it, it, where there's a lot of friction and where there's some sort of double illusion of transparency when Americans talk about hacking and how awesome it is and what you can make. Like, look at Kickstarter and how Kickstarter people go to Accelerator, which is in Shenzhen. And so we have this weird two-sided monologue but not an actual dialogue which is um, interesting from a cultural perspective um, yes so a lot of people drank the silicon valley kool-aid and think that yay like you can make it you just have to hack a thing and you can make it but what does it even mean so yeah uh, that's that's sort of how it so so compared to to American scene, the European scene is way more political. Um, in general, and compared to, and the, the the Asian scene is way way at least in China, and to some extent also in Singapore um, is way way more focused on the entrepreneurial or capitalist part of the hacker scene and less of this socialist slash communist ideal enshrined into it to some extent. So it's, for me, it's been really interesting and also really weird. Mm. Can you tell me more about the uh, European scene? The European scene? Yeah. Um, You're saying that it's more um, civic? More yes. The CCC, for example, like prime example, they got they get calls on by the by our German Supreme Court to to give their expert opinion on matters, which is a thing I haven't seen anywhere else. So, so in that respect, it's it's way more political, and also the, the CCC is an established political actor in the the whole realm of politics at least in Germany and it's also it, it started to trickle into the EU with um, people like uh, Julia Rida for example um, but it's they're sort of established as experts and thus they 
they get listened to and they're ignored, like most experts, but at least they get listened to, at least formally. So that's way different from the US where a lot of stuff is more action-based. It's more based on campaigns. Why they're not apart from the EFF, like you have the EFF and the ACLU, but the ACLU also has a lot of other civil liberties things that don't necessarily have to do with computers and hacking, while the EFF is specifically focused on that. Um, but a lot of what's going on there is very much based around campaigns. While in, 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 in Europe it tends to be more subtle. Yes, there are action groups like uh, Jeremy Zimmermann with uh, La Quadrature du Net, which were against um, web filters and censorship. That sort of did all get stitched back together. Um, but it's the, the activism model, at least in Europe, is way more along the lines of grassroots activism and less around campaigning for a general around a general topic. Mm. That's for example that's why we still have, for example, the Bündnis Privatsphere here in Leipzig, um, which explicitly focuses on privacy issues and not just a single issue. Mm. Okay. And um so the CCC is explicitly, well, hacking in Europe is explicitly political. Um, it, it's not explicitly political, but it doesn't shy away. Right. Like, if you talk po about politics in, in, the, in the American hacker scene, people almost get an allergic reaction, like they have an aneurysm, like, it's like shocking to some extent. Um, but they're... They're moving towards the idea that, hey, we are actually some sort of movement and we can change things. Um, but yeah, but the, the CCC itself is not political as in... The CCC, or the better way to put it, the CCC is a player within a democratic realm, but the CCC itself is not political as in it doesn't have a political manifesto or so. So it's not a party or so. Okay, and uh, sorry, something just hit my mind. Um, right, and there's this law that bans hacking tools. Oh, jeez! Yeah, paragraph or article two o two c in the Criminal Code of Germany. Yes, like I know that very well. What do you want to know about that? How did it get there? How did it get there? And why is the definition... Well, there's no definition, is there? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, I have to swap hats for a moment. <laughs> um, the, the idea, or at least what I perceive as the idea behind this, uh, these changes in the criminal code is that people saw, oh damn, like there are these criminals using computers these days, so we have to do something. And then, especially in the time where it was conceived, like computer was still a novel thing. So like, like what is what is computer crime? Like if I if I blackmail you, is that is that blackmail or cyber something? No, it's still blackmail, just using a computer instead of a gun, but hey, so, so that's one thing. But on the other hand, there are some, some types of crimes which tend to be specific to computers. Um, and so I think the lawmakers were profoundly confused about what they did, and, um, both in what they were actually outlawing and also what they intended to achieve. Like the best indication is, at least to my knowledge, not many people have been convicted of this actual law. So most most people actually, or could be trialed to some extent. Like 
one section actually says if you have a list of passwords what does that mean i mean you can argue from a to put my hacker back head back on um you can argue from at least a computer science perspective if you don't have a password you have an empty list so an empty list could also be an empty list of passwords right so that's where you have a password blah 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 so that would be a pure logical conclusion but it's not how it was intended and then also if you have a password manager you tend to have a password manager where you have a list of different passwords sort of illegal yes no maybe no one knows um but what i think again is it was a the emergent behavior of that law wasn't well thought out and the people who were expert on the subject matter were ignored because they were expert on the subject matter. Um, as in, of, there is, think of yourself, you're a lawmaker, and then you, you, you get told like, oh, there's this whole computer crime thing going on, these evil hackers, and then you're supposed to talk to people who even call themselves hackers. So you're talking to very people whose behavior you try to police. And of course they argue against it. So you're not going to listen to them because that's also your expect expectation of what they would argue for and against. So that's why I think that that opinion didn't have as much weight. And since they didn't get listened to, no matter what the actual arguments are, they won't get listened to that much. Although the argument would be totally rational, would have been gone out of the window like no rip listen to them um so that's from a social dynamic point of view um and what i also came to believe is that it's about selective persecution it's a charge you can tag onto something it's if you, if you look at politics in general, there are a lot of laws being passed that are highly ambiguous. And you can be persecuted, or you can, or you may, be, or you may or maybe not be persecuted, but it's to some extent totally up to the state attorney. And even that may be subject to politics. Like, actually, politics, politics. Mm -hmm. um, because even the state attorney is, as opposed to what most people think, it is actually a servant of the state. He's ex that's why it's called the state attorney. He's, he's explicitly there to argue the view of the state and what should be criminal and what not. And in that respect also, of course, political. He's not independent like judges are. Um, so I think it also, to some extent, was intended to have this selective prosecution, to just have this threat you can roll out against people. It's sort of like terrorism now it's like it's so vague and ambiguous what does it even mean what constitutes terrorism it's like if i say or if i yell the ten commandments it's okay and if someone else like someone from the middle east yells his ten commandments it's not cool and then the only difference is because they pray to a different god which is weird and then the actual difference is just like i'm white and they are brown I'm like, but how should this make a difference? But there you see a similar pattern of like being confused of what's going on and also feeling this urge of something needs to be done. And if it's just for show and not thinking through the potential detrimental effects. That's the long answer. Oh God, that was a long answer. Has, has the law ever been used though? Um, I don't know. I actually, I was part of an investigation, but I don't remember if I was also tried or the, in accordance to that law. Hmm. It's also like a couple of years ago, um, which got dropped and everything. Uh, I don't remember, but what it had, it had a severe chilling effect. I had multiple people leaving 
Germany and actually whole research departments of security companies who are leaving Germany because of that law. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of what's now going on with um, America and also the UK to some extent. It's like you have laws in place which can be devastating if they're used against you and people it's just people are crept out by that. Um, and so they're leaving. Is the chilling effect still going on right now? Um, no, I don't think so. In in part because it, no one has ever been trialed, at least not publicly enough. Um, and also because there's there's a new generation now; they don't know about this fight. And they probably don't know about this law in particular. Hmm. But the law is there. So yes, of course. Um, is there any concern that, uh, you know, maybe it should be challenged? At least, you know, removed? Um, because it seems like it's, it's not just a, a chilling effect for uh, people practicing hacking. Mm-hmm. Right? It's also a threat to the economy itself if, pe- if FDI is leaving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there um, any concern around that? No, because um, the, the problem with this law in particular is that actually no one has been trialed. Right. And so you, you can make a public show of how ridiculous it is. Mm. Um, and few people say when they leave, why they leave. Um, and, and also, how would you quantify it? How would you feed it back to politicians like, oh, I mean, I know of three companies who left Germany after that law got passed because it was too risky for them. Uh, but how do you feed that back to politicians? Like, you say, okay, the three companies have left, and they're like, oh, damn, and th- then that's it. Two for most exam. Hmm. You have to really rub it in. But then also you can rub it in because no one has been trial now. So now we are stuck in this weird situation where there's no there's no going forward, going backwards, at least with respect to that. Um, and I do think to, to some extent I have to defend the lawmakers and that they were well-intentioned but ill-guided. But then how you how do you fix that? Like the, the German system isn't set up for revising laws easily. Hmm. Um, usually what tends to happen, you pass new laws and new laws or diffs or difference to other laws. But what I'm missing, for example, is like a use by date for legislation. You say, okay, let's use this thing and like maybe let it be in the books for like five years and then let's check. Have we actually persecuted someone under this law? Has it been successful? Has it even been useful? And then not just like drop it off. But that's a but it's a way of thinking at least German and maybe European society has to come at terms with because that's not in it's not in line with their culture and spiritual heritage because it's still much pretty influenced by the idea that there's a state and you have a sovereign and he's probably right if not we make him right or her right um yeah but the very idea of like that there is this state and that it has to continue to some extent mm. yeah mm. speaking of this um we had some conversations, you know, just around here, mm-hmm. and I asked, uh, uh, "Why is the law still there?" And, and somebody mentioned that it's it's also probably because uh, Germany doesn't have someone uh, young enough as a minister or like someone who is uh, working in in technology in government who is young enough to understand these things, and most of the politicians are really old. Do you think there's any truth in that? 
Yes and no. Um, I, I see how you can come to that conclusion, especially for example, if you look at Singapore, where you have Vivian, how is his name? Vivian Balakrishnan. Yes, like he is sufficiently young, uh, and he's in charge of what is that technology and something something. Mm -hmm. I think he's the foreign minister right now, right? Um, no, he's well. Even I can't remember. Communications. Yeah, communications. Something. Uh, something yeah. like ICT, and then. Yeah. Um, the environment somehow that was like a really strange combination when I saw it. I'm like, what? Uh, and then when I was in Singapore in the beginning of the year, I couldn't meet with him because he had to. He wasn't a foreign thing. He was called off for a foreign thing. I don't know a visit he had to do or something. Um, yeah. Um, yes. So I, I can see how people do that. See that and. But it's, what, what they are saying is this old, old thing you hear over and over that like politicians are detached from reality, yada, 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 and then you blame it on a generational conflict, yada, 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 with, whereas there is some truth to it. But people usually tend to stop there. And you have, for example, politicians at the German Bundestag, which is like the General Assembly, um, like Hans Christian Strübele, like who is old? Like he was in the student revolutions of like 68-69 and he was with the RAF, which was a ultra-left, uh, or at least he was lawyer for them, was an ultra-left um, political group. Um, which did bomb um, supermarkets and stuff. Um, so he's old by most technical definitions, but he's like still pretty much in line with what he stood for. And also when you look at his politics, he's pretty close to what you could call the street as, to po as opposed to what other people are doing. And that's it's, so, so the issue is not Age is, is I think, an, an, an obvious attribute you can latch onto, but it's highly misleading, just like skin color. It, it may be a first indication that if someone has a darker skin, he's probably not in, from Leipzig, but it doesn't hold true in an absolute sense. It's just a estimation which holds true now, but if we have a sudden influx of people with darker skin, then even that doesn't hold true anymore. Um, but so so that's this, so this like using the generation conflict, I think, is a to some extent a scapegoating tactic because even I can't ex explain a lot of things to my father and my mother, and they get it at least in the moment. Sometimes I have to explain it again and again, but they get it. In general, so it's not about age, it's more about being in line also with the populous things. And but that's that's not only an issue of that particular law, it's a general thing. Mm -hmm. Um, oh god, yeah, that's a general thing. You didn't ask me how to change it, so I don't have to answer that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Should I ask that question? Um, it's up to you. Um, I don't have a good answer to that because it's an actual systemic issue. Um, what I would like, if if I could make changes to the whole process, I would. force politicians to be at least to some extent responsible for the things they do. Like if they pass a law, they have to set a mark for themselves where they say, okay, that's how I know it was a good idea or was a bad idea. Basically how, how yeah, holding them accountable. Um, but also giving also them the room for failure and to say okay it was a stupid idea or maybe I didn't know that at the time that's also absolutely okay that's I'm I'm not arguing for absolute transparency in that sense for example because transparency can actually really really detrimental to society 
because transparency in many cases leads to facilitating wrong conclusions. Um, for example, I like currently we have this this thing going on where part of the populace want to know who are the lobbyists who have access to the Bundestag or General Assembly. Um, and they, the Bundestag says, nope, we don't give it to you. But I don't. I want to have this list. I don't want to know when a politician meets with those people. But I want to know who has access to them. Because if, we, if, if I see the daily schedule of a politician, I tend, not, not only I, most people would tend to draw conclusions from that. Um, and for example, why if I'm a politician, why shouldn't I hang out with a drug lord? I actually should at least once so I know how they people, how they tick, what are their concerns and maybe how, how like what makes them work so I can make it get a better sense. That doesn't necessarily say that I'm for drugs or that I'm, I'm condoning the work they do, but it's, it's important to at least be exposed to it. And just like, but just having this fact known would be really detrimental. Um, so that's why I'm not arguing for transparency for transparency's sake. I'm arguing for accountability, not for transparency here. So that's that is what needs to be changed. Kind of like um, how people argue that um, you, if the state does surveillance, they can correlate your activities and draw conclusions that are not necessarily true. Yes. Right. And and we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Like even humans do it. The, but the, the problem, especially if, you, if it comes to state surveillance, is the state has way way more power than they do. With, like if if I know where you're going, for example, by tracking your phone, like that's okay. But I don't have guns. I don't have a police. I don't have helicopters. And depending which part of the world you are, you make a wrong call, a wrong phone call, and you get a drone. Thanks for that. And and that is the the bigger issue here. So yeah, like if you have power, it has to be coupled with accountability.